Hello. This works. Oh, this is really bright. Hello, everyone. Can we hear me? OK. So how are you? Good, good. good. All righty. So one of the most common ways one of the most uh, common ways of expressing ourselves nowadays is to narrate our lives via social media. This was mentioned before. And people do this in a really creative way. They sort of like, narrate events throughout their whole lives, what they're doing, what they're thinking, feeling, and where they're going. And I tend not to do this too much, but I was urged by some friends to this week because, well, giving a TED Talk is fun, it's interesting, it's exciting. So I did, but I was really struck by the sorts of responses that I received in the comments section. What sorts of responses do you think I received? Right? Another? You. Yes, you do you. The truth is that you don't know much about me. In fact, you, many of you have just met me. And you could probably guess half of the things that people said to me. We've seen them all before, right? These sort of phrases that are used over and over again as a means of encouragement. Now, this is telling for a variety of reasons. I mean, social media permits us to just greatly expand our sphere of communication. I mean, I had friends who I hadn't spoken to in years, you know, lending a voice of encouragement. It was very warm and very endearing. Uh, but in another sense, there's something a little strange about all this. I mean, you predicted half of them, and they're used in so many different situations. It's like an equation. You can just kind of plug them in here and there. Oh, I'm giving a TED talk. Oh, I got into school, walking my dog. I don't know. Maybe. <laughs> You know, put up a cute picture of a puppy, get all this applause. And, and I got a lot of these, too. It's kind of a strange button, right? We get hundreds of them. What does it really mean? I don't, I don't know. It's so ambiguous. But we really like a lot of things. Uh, and I think th there's a lot to be said about this. I mean, you know, we enter the sphere online, and we're able to sort of galvanize support and energy for what we're doing. It's a great way of expanding ourselves. But in another sense, there's something a little tricky about this. I mean, the phrases that we use, the language that we use, is in some sense overused and overdone, trite and stale. And in some sense, this is a problem, right? Because we spend more and more time on these sites, right? And just to just end with Facebook, we've got have more than we even know what to do with, right? So this raised a variety of questions for me. I mean, what are we betraying ourselves? Are we giving up? Quality for quantity? I wondered about that. I recently interned, in fact, for a major news uh, outlet, and I was a digital intern. And very quickly, you know, I was overwhelmed because I had to be on so many of these all the time, and it just overstimulates you. It becomes grueling. You know, the posts are meant to just kind of pull you here, suck you in here, and you just become really quite uh, confused. It was too much for me. I learned that I couldn't do this kind of work. I was really thirsty for some literature, for a walk in the park. The irony here is that we're more connected than ever. And in fact, we're shrinking distances at an alarming rate. And yet, the sense of nearness and closeness to the world eludes us. We sort of live in a, in a cloud, a hyper-reality of sorts. And our sense of tangible connection to the world around us seems to be slipping through our fingers. So I thought this was worth investigating. And in many ways, it's a telling aspect of our age, right? People tend to have a glossy look, right? Stuck in the cloud. And this worried me because if the quality of our conversation is sort of this, as I showed you earlier, you know, trite and uninteresting and dry in a lot of ways, I thought that that might be affecting the way we see ourselves in the world and the degree to which we're able to authentically engage with ourselves. It seemed to me that first and foremost, language is the problem of our time, right? the careful and meaningful use of language. Here's a quote from one of the great romantic poets, Holderlin. And he says, poetically, man dwells. Poetically, man dwells. What does he mean by this? I think it's high time that we in our age begin to reflect on the meaning of these words, because I think they're pregnant with a very telling truth, something that we've forgotten, namely, not that human beings are all you know, lyrical poets, not as if we all write down poetry professionally. We're not all Shakespeare's. Uh, but in a sense, there's something to be said about the idea that human beings in their most fundamental essence are poetic creatures. That is, we mediate our relationship to the world through language. And it's not just a sort of reporting of data and facts all the time, telling people about what I'm doing today and what I'm doing tomorrow. 
mankind and human beings have a creative relationship to the world facilitated by language, right? Language does more than just report facts. It is the way through which we disclose new ways of thinking, right? And it is the vanguard of the things that matter to us. It's the way in which we give voice to the things that matter. So I think that in many ways, we need to return to a more poetic understanding of our relationship to the world, right? Not that we need to become poets, not that we need to dress up our language without, in excess, but rather that we need to become more careful with the use of our language, see it as an opportunity for something more. Right? I think that the metaphor that we need to move towards is less that language is a tool to affect the things I want for me to control things or to push ideas into someone, but rather language is a garden. Language is something that must be cultivated and cared for, not controlled. Right? Language can tell us the things that aren't important, and language is also the way in which we cultivate the things that do matter. And like a good gardener, it requires patience and diligence and a great deal of love and care. Right? So the lesson here is that not that we should become poets, but rather we should draw from the essence of poetic thinking and apply that essence into our everyday lives, right? So what is the mark of, of good poetry, or at least powerful artistic expression, right? Unlike the social media posts, which are meant to just pull your attention and throw you back out, and just, you know, you get pulled this way, you get pulled that way, and you become confused, poetic language somehow is able to envelop us. It captures us, it wraps us up in its embrace, and it brings it into its context. And yet at the same time, it's incisive. It pierces into the truth of our condition and what we feel. I think this is why we love stories so much, because they're able to grasp what is essential about our experience and give voice to it in a way that is inspiring and interesting and creative and, and novel. Right? Poetic language is also affirmative in some sense. Poets don't give voice to what they're feeling because they're nihilistic or because they don't care. And even when they're being negative, it's coming from a place of yes saying, as Nietzsche said. Right? You don't write a beautiful dystopic novel like uh, Brave New World, for instance, if you don't believe that there's something worth preserving in life. Right? And finally, it's truthful. It comes from a place of integrity, sincerity, and authenticity, even when you're using illusions and shadows to convey something. Right? And we can hear when language isn't truthful. Right? It bothers us. I was just talking to my friend Dan yesterday about this, the importance of authenticity. Right? So how can we begin to, as it were, cultivate the garden of language? How can we take from this wisdom and apply it every day? And I think there's some good news here because every conversation affords us opportunities. Right? Conversations with yourself, conversations with other people. And so what I want to do in, in closing is just provide you three important conversations that we can exercise this practice, right, and become cultivators of our world, right? So the first is ethics. Uh, the metaphor I want to use here is we're gnomes in a garden. So the ones on the left here are engaged in warfare or something, I don't know. And the other ones there are a little benign, and I'm doing this just to convey two aspects of ethical discourse. Now, ethics isn't just something for the philosophers, it's something we engage in every day whenever we make decisions about right and wrong, whenever we wonder about you know, what someone's actions are, the validity of someone's actions, when we wonder about whether or not people are being appropriate or truthful or good. Ethics is embedded in human life. It's something we encounter every day. Uh, but I find that too often, the left side of the, of the equation is emphasized over the right, right. We become a culture, and actually this was mentioned in a previous talk, of indictment. Right? Social media makes it so easy just to vent you know, angry frustration. Right? People are so quick right, to tell you what's wrong, to tell you how terrible you are. But they don't articulate a direction in which we ought to move. Ethics is about cutting out the weeds, as we, as we say in the garden. Right? Hopefully you don't use fertilizer to do this. Do this in a more sustainable way. But it's also about making space for the things that matter. When's the last time you heard the word flourishing in a conversation, right? The Greek term, I believe, is eudaimonia. What about self-actualization? What about transcendence? What about harmony in the true sense, right? The reason that we feel conviction 
to cut out the things that aren't so good is because we think there's something worth preserving, right? So we need to remember that ethics is affirmative, enveloping, incisive, and in some sense speaks to the truth, right? Ethics can be more poetic. Another is communion, right? I think what a lot of the drive behind our engagement in social media spheres is a desire for community, right? That's why I posted the TED Talk earlier. And this is telling because I think as society is becoming more secularized, for instance, you know, church attendance is decreasing and a lot of the ways in which people used to come together and worship together, sing together, reaffirm the things that they love are sort of dying away. And the irony here is that though we're more and more connected, our sense of nearness and closeness with each other is somehow stifled. We're more alienated uh, than ever. And so instead of engaging in the idle chatter, as they say, in the social media spheres and engaging in this trite and banal language, we should see time with people online or in person as an opportunity for genuine communion, right? We, in some sense, need to be more serious and careful about our conversations and at the same time, more spontaneous and creative and childlike in our conversations. Time with other people is an opportunity to reawaken the presence of the gods, to allow honey to drip from your mouths as you speak the words of poetry, right? So we need to be like those gnomes there, right? See them? And finally, I think one of the most important conversations are the conversations you have with yourself. And the quality of the language that you take to that conversation will in many ways dictate the quality of that outcome. And I find that you know, the maps that people have within their minds, the framework of ideas through which they interpret things are really kind of crappy, to be honest, right? So if you think of yourself as someone not worth anything, someone not capable of facing challenges, and you keep having that conversation with yourself, that in many ways is a pathology of the garden. You're allowing the weeds to grow. You gotta, you gotta do a little work there, right? And you have to do that with yourself. I also recommend getting creative. We like to think we're sane, but the truth is I think we're all a little crazy, and we like to talk to ourselves, at least I do, sometimes out loud. And, you know, make up a character or something. I like to talk to my doppelganger, sort of like a shadow version of yourself, and talk about what's going on. Right? And if you can bring in a more incisive, and powerful, and enveloping way of speaking to your conversation with yourself, the more you'll be able to reaffirm life in a truly poetic way. So just in closing, I want to remind you that the point here isn't that we just need to delete our Facebook accounts, go write out some poetry in the woods, and just shun all technology, right? That's not the point. The point is that we are embedded in a world that is changing in ways that we can't imagine. We're already here in a world that we haven't really grasped. We're always ahead of ourselves. And the quality of the conversation is in many ways going to dictate the quality of the life that we live, right? So don't forget that language is the vanguard of truth, and that it's through language that we can carve out new spheres of authenticity. Thank you. Thank you.